Today we're going to be talking about a skin condition that I know a lot of you struggle with called lichen sclerosis. Lichen sclerosis is a common chronic inflammatory skin condition that primarily involves the skin of the genitalia, the vulva, around the anus, the penis, but in some cases it can also involve skin outside of these areas like your chest, your neck, your shoulders. It presents as these porcelain white areas of very fragile skin that scar down and it can be super itchy. Lichen sclerosis can appear at any age but it most commonly affects women over the age of 50. It's 10 times more common in women compared to men. One of the things that can be very frustrating for patients with lichen sclerosis is that it often can occur alongside or after another chronic inflammatory skin condition in those areas, whether it be vitiligo, psoriasis, another lichen skin condition called lichen simplex, where you have chronic itch and rubbing of the skin. That can be followed by the onset and development of lichen sclerosis. There's likely an underlying genetic component to lichen sclerosis. Many people with lichen sclerosis have a family history of it. It commonly occurs in people who have other autoimmune conditions. For example, about 20% of women with lichen sclerosis will also have autoimmune thyroid disease. And many men and women who have lichen sclerosis also have vitiligo or alopecia areata or other autoimmune conditions like pernicious anemia. Lichen sclerosis is thought to be an autoimmune condition because about 60 to 80% of women at least diagnosed with lichen sclerosis will have something called antibodies, which are things that your immune system makes to attack things. But instead of these little antibodies attacking pathogens, invaders, they start to attack you. And in the case of lichen sclerosis, patients develop antibodies to attack something called extracellular matrix one. Not everyone has these antibodies who has lichen sclerosis, but they are pretty common in women who have the condition and are thought to play a role in it. And because of the identification of these antibodies, Lichen sclerosis is largely thought to be an autoimmune condition. What brings it out in some people is not entirely clear, but there's definitely often a history of a prior trauma to the area that is affected, or maybe there was a skin infection that healed up and triggered this, or as I said, a lot of times it coexists or follows another inflammatory skin condition like vitiligo or psoriasis. Anything that is irritating to the skin also can be associated with eliciting lichen sclerosis. It is almost unheard of for men to have lichen sclerosis who were circumcised in infancy. Because of this, it's thought that perhaps chronic intermittent trapping of urine under the foreskin in men, that may elicit some sort of inflammatory response that in individuals who have maybe a genetic predisposition towards this will subsequently develop lichen sclerosis. Body wash, shampoo, soaps, bubble bath can actually get trapped in the genital skin folds and not get rinsed out properly. If it's intermittently getting trapped there, it can lead to irritation and possibly trigger this condition. Because it's most common in postmenopausal women, there likely is a hormonal component playing a role. With menopause and the decline of estrogen, the skin overall starts to thin and so that may play a role in bringing out this condition because the way this condition presents is you get these patches of very very fragile skin they have the appearance of most cigarette paper and because they're so fragile the skin there is very vulnerable to trauma it can develop blisters blood blisters and frank ulcers with just minor trauma this is an inflammatory condition the inflammation coming into the skin leads to a lot of itch for patients scratching that fragile skin can elicit blistering and sores. In women, genital lichen sclerosis most often involves the vulva, the labia minora, but it can extend to involve wider areas. It also can involve the skin around the clitoris and the anus. Lichen sclerosis typically spares the mucosa. If this inflammatory condition goes on unchecked, untreated, what unfortunately ends up happening in many cases is the development of something called adhesions, basically scar tissue that can distort the anatomy in that area. That can lead to pain with sex, pain with urination, difficulty with urination, and a lot of discomfort accompanied by the itch. This can be a, such a painful, painful, an isolating condition to cope with. It really, really has a tremendous negative impact on someone's overall quality of life. And in the case of men, while not as common, when it does happen in men, it typically involves the head of the penis. It can lead to the formation of what are called adhesions, scar tissue, that can actually mess up the urethral opening and make urination difficult, painful. The inflammation and scarring in lichen sclerosis in men can be so severe that it results in something called phimosis, 
this, which is when the foreskin cannot retract. Let's talk about the extra genital lichen sclerosis. This can happen too. About 10% of women who discover they have lichen sclerosis on their body will also have genital lichen sclerosis at the same time. Only 6% of men and women who have a new diagnosis of extra genital lichen sclerosis will have no genital disease. So in other words, more often than not, if you have extra genital lichen sclerosis, it's very common to have genital involvement as well. When lichen sclerosis appears on other body sites, the hair follicles can be very, very obvious, and they also can have little keratin plugs in them. Just like in genital lichen sclerosis, extra genital lichen sclerosis, the skin is very susceptible to bruising, uh, bleeding, blistering, sores, and ulcers. The reason for this is that with lichen sclerosis, the autoimmune attack and the pattern of inflammation that comes into the skin as that inflammation comes in, it essentially chews away and weakens the supportive junction between the epidermis and the dermis. And so the skin is vulnerable to blistering. It shears away easily from the underlying dermis. Having this, like I said, having this condition is no walk in the park. It's really important that it be diagnosed as soon as possible because there are complications that can and do arise. We've already talked about some of the complications such as phimosis, problems with urination, painful sex, narrowing of the vaginal opening. But people who have lichen sclerosis in the genitals, they're at risk for infections. Most commonly candida, that's that little yeast, causes yeast infections. If you have lichen sclerosis, you are at a greater risk for candida yeast infections. Also at a greater risk for reactivation of the herpes virus causing herpes simplex in that area, which on top of very fragile skin of lichen sclerosis can really lead to a lot of pain, ulcers. It can really be quite miserable. Also at an increased risk for infections with the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus. But importantly, people with lichen sclerosis the genitalia, the anogenital skin, they're at an increased risk for squamous cell carcinoma in those areas, likely because of the chronic inflammatory nature of this condition. Roughly 5% of women with genital lichen sclerosis will develop squamous cell carcinoma in the affected area, especially if their lichen sclerosis is not being treated, it's poorly controlled, they have all that inflammation on an ongoing basis. Now, in the case of extra genital lichen sclerosis um, on your body, fortunately, those those areas are not at an increased risk for squamous cell carcinoma. It's just the genital, the anogenital skin. How do you know that you have this? Making the diagnosis of lichen sclerosis, it's not as straightforward as one might think. While the skin lesions are pretty characteristic, it can look an awful lot like a lot of other conditions that happen in this area, like vitiligo, for example. A biopsy is essential to diagnose this. Unfortunately, not all biopsies end up being helpful. Oftentimes, patients may have to have multiple biopsies to really get at an accurate diagnosis. Accurate diagnosis is so important. For you as a patient, it's really important that you find a provider who takes your symptoms seriously and is going to be with you, making sure that they have properly evaluated for this. Don't hesitate to seek out a second or third opinion because this is your health. And like I said, there are complications with this condition if it goes undertreated, undiagnosed. Let's talk about treatment. In general, just as far as your day-to-day -day in managing and dealing and coping with the condition, very gentle skincare is recommended, mild cleansing, avoiding any soaps, douches, bath soaps, uh, detergents, anything that could potentially be irritating in that area. No bubble bath. Bubble bath easily will get trapped in the folds in the general area and can really aggravate this condition, so avoid that. Avoid really tight, restrictive clothing that's gonna rub there and cause friction. The skin cannot handle that when you have lichen sclerosis. It will blister, it will elicit more pain, discomfort for you. Try and wear loose fitting clothing. Avoid activities that could aggravate this condition like bike riding, horseback riding, anything that's going to put a lot of pressure, friction, traction on that skin. Emollients are helpful to alleviate the dryness. Barrier creams like a zinc oxide diaper rash cream, for example, or plain petroleum jelly can be very helpful for not only acting as a skin protectant, reducing frictional forces on that otherwise vulnerable skin, but these also serve as a barrier for irritants. And irritants will 
will include urine and feces that can really, really aggravate this condition. And so barrier creams can help protect the skin from those irritants. As far as medical treatment, typically the first line treatment is a prescription ultra potent steroid ointment, clebatazole. This is used daily just to the affected spots for roughly three months until symptoms come under control. And then thereafter, you use the ointment a couple of times a week as maintenance to control the condition. When you're using your prescription steroid ointment to treat this condition, where you put it makes the difference. It's super important. So when your doctor prescribes you this, they, you know, have them sit there with you, get a mirror, and have them help you identify where exactly you need to be putting this ointment. It's gonna go to the porcelain white areas of affected skin. You don't wanna put the ultra potent steroid ointment all over. You really only need a tiny amount of thin film and just to those spots, not everywhere else. If you aren't aware, steroid ointments, they do have potential side effects thinning of the skin, stretch marks. So you only wanna put it where it's needed, the active spots that need to be quieted down by that ultra potent steroid, but you don't wanna put it to the surrounding healthy skin because that surrounding healthy skin, it can be negatively impacted by it. So once your doctor shows you where to put it, how to use it, when you're at home, take the time to get a mirror to make sure you are just applying it where you need to. That can really help. Ultra potent steroid ointments are very effective for this and can help get it under control. Control is key to prevent the complications of scarring, infection, squamous cell carcinoma. In addition to that, intravaginal estrogen creams and pessaries can be really helpful for postmenopausal women who have thinning and atrophy of the skin in that area to help reduce dryness. While ultra potent topical steroid ointments are very effective for this, they don't always get the job done or sometimes they need to be used for a longer time without a break. So a lot of times patients will actually do well to switch over to a class of medications called calcineurin inhibitors. These are a lot more precise in terms of how they target the inflammatory response in comparison to ultra potent steroid ointments. They have far fewer side effects. These include the medication Pimcrolimus and Tacrolimus, otherwise known as Protopic and Elodil. As far as extragenital lichen sclerosis, tretinoin actually can be pretty helpful for reducing the flakiness and the fragility, but tretinoin is not well tolerated at all in the genital area, so it's not utilized for genital lichen sclerosis. That that being said, oral retinoids like isotretinoin and acetretin, aka seriotane, actually can help control this disorder in patients who are inadequately controlled on topicals alone. Another intervention that can be really helpful is to inject steroids directly into the skin. It's called Kenalog or triamcinolone that is injected right into the skin lesion along with a little bit of numbing medicine so it's not painful. Uh, this can really help calm down the inflammatory response and, and silence the, the condition and suppress it. So we mentioned oral retinoids, but for a lot of patients, they end up actually doing pretty well if they're not adequately controlled on topicals. They actually end up doing pretty well with the oral medication methotrexate. Now methotrexate uh, is it, used widely in dermatology for a lot of conditions like psoriasis, for example. It's used in rheumatology to treat a lot of autoimmune diseases. It can work quite well for this, but it, it, you know, it does have potential side effects. So that's not to say it's not safe, but it's more involved. So ideally you do well with topicals, but if not, this is an option that can be pretty effective. Alternatively, the medication cyclosporin can likewise be pretty helpful. It's, it's a medication that's used for a lot of autoimmune issues. Uh, it's used for psoriasis and it, it can help get this under control. Now, for some patients, unfortunately, if their condition is not caught early, the inflammation persists untreated. You know, like I said, they can go on to have pretty severe scarring, disfigurement. It can affect urinary functions. For men who don't adequately respond to initial rounds of topical ultra potent steroid ointments, they should be circumcised to slow down down suppress the condition, but if they've already developed uh, problems with the urethral opening narrowing, then they'll have to have some sort of surgical intervention. Women who have developed scarring and adhesions, they can undergo surgery to release those adhesions to open up the vaginal opening if it's narrowed. 
Uh, in some cases, women can use vaginal dilators, but those don't always work. Um, so there are surgical interventions to alleviate some of the consequences of scarring in that area. What is the outlook for this condition? Like if you have it, are you gonna go on to develop the severe scarring? Not necessarily. I, you know, I don't want this video to scare you, to alarm you. The good news is that for most patients, if they're treated early and their symptoms are controlled, some of these things like scarring can be prevented. In the case of patients who develop extra genital lichen sclerosis and they don't have any genital disease, extra genital lichen sclerosis will oftentimes just burn out by itself and go away. But if genital lichen sclerosis is treated early, it can undergo remission. There's no cure for it, but we can get it to go into remission with treatment, especially if treatment is offered early on. That is why getting an accurate diagnosis is so important. And it's so important that you have a physician that you trust because when this condition you need to be followed regularly and monitored for not only treatment response, but also disease activity. Like, is your lichen sclerosis starting to come back? Uh, you need to have regular exams. That can be really traumatic to go through. Like I said at the beginning of the video, this condition sometimes follows a trauma. So it can be a lot, but it's very important uh, if you have this condition to make sure that not only is the condition controlled and not coming back, but that you aren't developing complications of scarring, infections, or God forbid, squamous cell carcinoma. Because if you develop carcinoma in that area and it's not caught early, it can become quite involved, and it's just not anything that you, you want to, to have going on. All right, guys, so I really hope this video was helpful to you all who have this condition, who are asking about it. It is a very difficult thing to go through. It's very painful, it's very uncomfortable. It can be incredibly frustrating. Stay on, be an advocate for yourself. Don't hesitate to seek out multiple additional opinions. Uh, specialties, whether it be dermatology, gynecology, urology, uh, and don't, don't hesitate to ask to see another doctor if you don't feel like your symptoms are being taken seriously because this is a serious condition. Now, if you're not sure you have this condition but you deal with a lot of itching down there, I want you to watch the video that I'm gonna put on the end slate. I have, it's all about why you have itch down there. So check that one out because there are a lot of reasons why you could have itching in the downstairs area. So watch that one next. But if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, Sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.